right, so it's the last talk of the show. There are still plenty coming in, I guess, uh, but I start introducing. Um, for the last talk, we wanted to have something very different. Um, and with very different, I don't mean that it's the one talk that's done by a Windows PC and not by a Mac. <laughs> uh, with the last segment, I want to have something that makes beep, boop, blink, uh, and this uh, audio-visual uh, excitement. So um, we searched for a long, long time until we found an amazing video by Mathieu. Um, and I, I found it funny because uh, I, I, I know a little, a little French. And I knew that Mathieu and his last name, Henri, are both actually first names. Um, until I found out that his full name is... Okay, don't leave me there. Uh, his full name is... Mathieu Laurent Jacques Georges Henri. So please welcome Mathieu Laurent Jacques Georges Henri. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I will start with a slide of my daughter. Uh, this is Vida. She's six years old. She's very kind. She's crazy, crazy daredevil. Um, but she's also very, 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 very curious. And we're all curious here. I mean, we've all come a long way. Well, we have come a long way to come here to learn new skills, hear about new techniques. And it's just to feed our curiosity and our creativity. Um, and that's because we are makers above all. We, we build or we write software to help people. We write useful things and we use our curiosity to learn new skills to build these useful things to help people. But tonight, I would like to invite you to write useless code. I would like to invite you to use your creativity and your curiosity to code art. Uh, so, my name is Mathieu Henry. I go online as P01. And the things you see in the background are some of my projects. Uh, they, they all have some, some visuals, some are interactive, some have sound, some, yes, some are games even. Um, and they all range anywhere from 64 bytes to one kilobyte up to four kilobytes. And this silly size comes from the fact that I love to write uh, procedural generation, which is r generating all your assets, images, sound, levels, anything, uh, with code. I, I, I like to to code everything. And I come from the demo scene. It's a, it's a subculture that is about 30, 35 years old. Uh, that is about pushing the technical and artistic boundaries of any platform we touch. Um, so to code art, I think it boils down to having a creative mindset. It boils down to knowing the standards, knowing your platform, and abusing it in ways that people didn't think about initially and gaining a visual understanding of mathematics. Um, you don't have to get scared about big formulas. All you need is really to understand what is happening. So here's a small example, uh, about 56 bytes. And it generates the maze that you see in the background. Uh, this is in diagonal. Um, what is going on there is whenever the user moves the mouse, uh, I use the x coordinate of the mouse to pick randomly uh, one of three characters which you see in the string with the forward and backward uh, slashes. The third character that you don't see is a zero with white space. And I need it because if you just add these uh, slashes, then there's nothing to break the line. And if I put a normal white space, then you would see gaps between the, the slashes, the diagonals. So using zero with white space is like a nice trick to actually introduce ways to break the lines. So you see, it's, uh, you, you need to understand a bit the standard and abuse them to create these kind of things. Uh, in my projects, since I'm into uh, procedural generation and also into small sizes, uh, I like to not use any frameworks or libraries, just to write the minimum amount of code I need to solve the problem at hand. And also, I try to use one drawing primitive, like can be particles, lines, triangles, polygons, anything. Uh, and one formula to drive the visuals and the sound, that way things stay in sync and you know, get nice things. Uh, what you see in the background is just thousands of triangles. Even the, f like the big line, what you see in the middle across the screen, is just a very flat triangle. 
It was just easier to code and more usable. Um, for, to do some animations, you, you probably have to play a little bit with trigonometry, uh, which is just a big word to talk about things moving along circles and smooth shapes. Um, things don't have to be perfect. We, we're not trying to save lives or to finance applications in this case. Uh, so we can use approximations, and that's cool. You probably heard that pi is more or less 22 divided by 7. Um, pi over 3 is very close to 1. And you see this over approximation. They are good enough in most cases for, for animations. And yeah, it's, it's fine. Don't, don't get scared of using them. Uh, <laughs> numbers in JavaScript and many other languages uh, are based on this standard, uh, which says that numbers are based in binary. And they are in composition of powers of twos and uh, fractions of power of twos, which leads to uh, so-called floating point errors. So in, if we do 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1, we don't get exactly 0.3. We get 3004. Uh, what's completely normal according to the spec. It's a bit unexpected for us people, uh, but that's how it is. Um, so if you do a loop uh, from 0 to 10 with an increment of 0.1, the loop does not end with 10. It ends at 10, 0, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. And uh, the numbers on that loop are not expressed exactly. It also means that you cannot end the loop here by doing a, a strict check against 10, because you never reach 10. You don't reach exactly 10. However, if you use an increment that is um, a fraction of power 2, then all the numbers along that loop can be expressed exactly. And that gives a nice property. So for instance, I could the loop here could end with a strict check against 10. And we can check, for instance, the modulo 1 of i uh, in that loop. And that just tells us if it's, it will be exactly 0 if i is an integer, because all the numbers can be expressed exactly. So that gives some nice properties, like understanding what is going on. For your projects, uh, you will want to have some color. And of course, HSL comes to mind. It's a, it's a nice color space. Uh, where you set the hue uh, along a color wheel and then the saturation and the luminance. So what you see here is uh, these small dots going around the color wheel. It's very nice, except that it's a bit, it's a bit slow for browsers to actually pass this notation, HSL, and convert it back to RGB. So instead, we can look at what is going on there. It's not one wheel, it's actually three wheels. We, we see that there's a splash of blue, a splash of red, a splash of green. And they are just shifted by one third of the circle. So we can do the math ourselves. Uh, we can use the RGB notation and follow a circle, a color wheel, for the three different components offset by one third of the circle. And it's a lot faster. So it's, it's about yeah, understanding what is happening. And if it's slow, use another approach. Uh, to, to give a a good impression of movement in your, uh, in your project, it's nice to add some motion blur. And it can be as simple as that, as not clearing the whole screen and rendering the whole thing again. You can just clear at 10% or 5%, and then you leave a little bit of the previous frame, and then you draw on top, and you clear, almost clear, and leave a little bit, and so on. It's also nice to make things glow or shine. Um, with CSS, it's as simple as using box shadow that works. There's no, no problem with that. Um, if you use Canvas, you can use uh, Shadow Blur. Uh, shadow Blur is, is not just about shadows. It's just about drawing the same shape that you just drew, but blurry. And if you put a bright color, it's a glow. If you put a dark color, it's a shadow. And there's other ways to do it. Um, and it's nice to have music in your art projects. You can load an MP3 or an Opera so That's totally fine. Uh, but I'm into procedural, uh, procedural generation, so I like to generate the music myself. Uh, and there's two ways to do it uh, on the web. There's the audio element, which is very basic. You just load an, um, a sound, and you play it, and you have just a few functions to play with volume and so on. Or there's the web audio API, which lets you build a whole graph of nodes, of audio nodes, with gains, filters, and so on and so forth. Uh, using the audio element, what we can do is we can actually l build a wave file and load it as a data URL. So first two lines you see at the top, just create the header of the wave file. Two lines in the middle uh, build this whole sample, this whole music. And the last two lines, 
create a new audio object, and load it and play it. It's under 200 bytes. Um, and using the audio API, uh, we create an audio context, and we can create a script processor, uh, which then you connect to a destination, and then it gets an audio process event whenever the audio context needs a new small buffer of sound to play, and then we can populate that buffer in JavaScript and do whatever we want. And that's also under 200 bytes. So of course, you see that there's this magic byte bit thing. Uh, it means that we have to program the music, like really program. Uh, so we have to build the instruments ourselves. The most simple example is a hi-hat. Uh, it sounds like and what it is, is basically an oscillator, a noise in this case, or a hi-hat, uh, which is in the first line, with an exponential decay, uh, the envelope on the second line, which is just the position of an inside the note with a big power so that it, it doesn't go smooth, or it doesn't go linearly, it goes like with an exponential decay. And the volume, and you compose all that, and you get your sample. So building these small building blocks and composing them together, you create some music. Um, so. Of course, you will need a render loop to display the frames of your animations. And if you're a nice citizen, you will use request animation frame, which is the right thing to do. It works. It actually works when it has to, uh, to just render one frame. And if you're in another tab, it doesn't call it. And if you uh, unplug your laptop or anything, it will, it will render at half the frame rate on this kind of optimization. Uh, but if you're a bit naughty and you already use the audio, uh, audio process uh, or script processor, uh, you can abuse uh, the script node and audio process to hit two birds with one stone. You can not only render the audio in the audio process event, but render also the visuals. Of course, you have a bit less time and you have a funky frame rate, but it works. <laughs> so why not? So you see, it's really about getting creative mindset about uh, abusing the standards and getting a visual understanding of, or an understanding of what is going on, what and the mathematics behind some things. Um, so this is some ideas of how to code art. So I think it's time to make art with code, <laughs> to fire the editor. And so, um, so today, Sorry, but um, I would like to use two uh, two things that I really like: uh, particles and vector fields. Particles are just like you can think of them as like fireflies. They're just small dashes of colors that fly around. They have a lifetime and they just go in one direction and, or turn and then spawn somewhere else. And vector fields. Uh, this is a bit what you see when you're looking at the weather forecast, and there's this map of the wind that shows where the wind is blowing at any point on on the map. Uh, so we, we're going to try to do that and uh, have some sound too. So let's split my screen. Okay. So let's switch to this live.html file, uh, file which I have here. Uh, so it's really basic. Uh, there's just uh, not much going on, just a canvas. Uh, that is with a dark background, full size, and we load a file called live.js. And that's our setup. Um, I just have a little bit, little bit of boilerplate uh, to have some notes and basic oscillators for later. And let me turn on <laughs> my notes so I know a bit where I am in the time. Perfect. Um, so, let's, let's get going. Uh, there. If we look at the folder structure, we see that there's an image. Uh, so I would like to load it uh, just to have a nice background. So I'll go back to the, the file. So we need this image. Load and unload. Um, yeah, you'll see the code is a bit dirty. Um, in my day job, I write TypeScript and everything. It's super clean. Here, <laughs> I don't have time. 
<laughs> Sorry. Um, so uh, we have our canvas that has an ID called C. So we just get the context so we can draw on the canvas. Uh, we need to set the width of this canvas, and it would be useful to store uh, the width and height. And we'll use the natural width of the image. Uh, the height, same, would be useful to store it. And we can do perfect. We have our image. So, because we will do an animation, we need a time value uh, which starts at zero. Um, I will use the audio context on the script processor uh, technique to to get my render loop and uh, sound loop. So I do you see call new audio context. So I create a new audio context, and I will do uh, create a script processor from it. Uh, just a few samples, 2048. There's no no input, we are not listening to the microphone or anything, and we just output in mono, but as we'll do. We need to connect this script processor to the destination of the audio context. And yeah, and listen to the audio process event uh, to call our render function. And our render function will be Um, we'll take the audio data right away. Um, so that's on the, the argument. Uh, it's on the output buffer of this event, and we get the channel data for the first channel that we will emit. Um, and we can let's draw the image there, and let's see that we didn't break anything. Good, we didn't break anything. So now let's increment the time. Uh, so actually, uh, this render function is called each time uh, the audio context has consumed the audio buffer, uh, the audio data. So we need to increment our time by audio data dot length divided by the sample rate of our audio context. And we can display this time in the title of a page. I will do. So we see the time here in seconds. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, yeah. What we can do is uh, set not draw the image at full opacity, but we can say one divided by one twenty eight. Let's see. So it should fade in. Yes, that's good. Okay. So I said I wanted to make particles, so we should get started on that. Uh, let's take a particles count, um, 2,000 ish. Uh, we need an array, uh, and I will do particles count, and particles. And I will start with something very simple, and I will just give a time to live to these particles, DTL. Uh, Uh, so we'll send the visuals. I can copy this, this tiny loop here. So we can do uh, p equal. Uh, yeah, I, I said the code is uh, is messy here. You see, there's globals everywhere. That's fine. Uh, so <laughs> the we have this time to leave this TTL uh, on the particle. So we need to see, check is is the particle dead and decrement the time to leave. So we we'll do on the current particle, decrease the time to live, and if it's zero, we will reinitialize it. Um, I can say, yeah, I that. Um, so then we will just set a random x value uh, on, yeah, from zero to the width, and random y value from zero to the height of our canvas. And we need to draw these particles. So just fill style. Uh, 
P dot X, P dot Y. Yeah, it's just something. So we see these things. Um, le let me let me fix the, the speed at which uh, the uh, the background image is drawn, and it would be nice to actually, so I can play with it also with a mouse and control it. So we just something super basic. Uh, we need a mouse coordinate in X, in Y, and on mouse move. Mx call e dot page x divided by you know width, and the y is page y. Yeah, so that gives me uh, mx and my will be the mass coordinate between zero and one on the screen on my viewport, uh, and I can then uh, where I clear the screen, I can say or actually <coughs> use the y coordinate to this to decide how how much we should draw the image. Uh, so here I just don't draw it much and we uh, we see the particles a lot and, and yeah and here again. Uh, so okay <laughs> back to our particles. Um, I need yeah they are, they are not moving <laughs> and also they don't have the time to leave. Uh, I did not set it. Uh, they, they die instantly. So I just give them a time to leave. Now we can see them. And of course, this thing about using the mouse makes a bit more sense. Because you can really see, like, if the mouse is all the way to the top, you really see the particles. If the mouse is all the way down, you see the image. So, yeah, we can control that. OK, now we need to add, uh, to make these particles move around. So we, we need to give them a velocity. Uh, like velocity is just speed in x. Uh, so, random to the rescue. Ta -da. Uh, we need velocity in x, velocity in y. We can do px. So of course we need to add the speed and the velocity to the x and y coordinate. So p dot dx, p dot y. So now we should see them move in some direction. And of course, if I don't clear the image too much, you can see some kind of trail behind them. Uh, let's let's do this. Um, when when you multiply a value by square itself, when you square it, it, it makes it like a bit exponential. It's a bit nicer to control. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, let's add some colors too. That would be nice because these white particles are not super interesting. Uh, so we'll use the RGB notation. And uh, <laughs> uh, so let's start from like me medium value. Uh, RGB is between zero and two fifty five. So let's start at half of that, one twenty eight, and let's use the speed to actually decide on the the color to influence the color. This thing uh, or zero just make like a, a binary or uh, so. Basically, it says like cast this expression to binary and put an or. So basically, it's basically math dot floor, uh, but shorter. And I just spent more time to explain it than to write it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so let's do this, and let's be wild. Uh, let's make the blue component depend on the the overall speed, uh, so, or the square of the speed. Uh, so it just, took, uh, and also with a R0. So now we should get a color that depends on that direction. This is nice. Um, we can also, like these particles, they, they are all like in the same, like same orientation, despite the fact that they are moving somewhere in one direction. Uh, so let's, what we can do is we can actually set the transform, uh, transformation matrix, sorry for a big word, of the canvas to basically say how to draw things, how to actually transform things uh, in the canvas. And we can actually uh, define the transform matrix or the transform, 
So it, it actually reflects the direction of the particles. Uh, so if we do this, So the first number that you see here, uh, they basically define how the x and y coordinate are transformed. Uh, and in this case, it says like transform them based on the velocity and the speed. So they will follow the orientation of a particle. And then we actually, we will draw the particle in, in the coordinate of a particle, so p, x, and p, y. So then our field rate just needs to be at zero, zero. Uh, and of course, when we clear the screen, we just need to reset the transform. Uh, so now you see that uh, these tiny squares Let's do this. this is the same. It just says, don't touch the x and y coordinate and start from 0, 0. Uh, this is, don't touch the x, y coordinate. This is, start from the top right, top left. Um, okay, so n now these, uh, these tiny dots, we are, let's make them bigger so we can see. Good. Now you can see that they are not actually all like, like this. They actually turn in the direction that they are moving. So uh, that's better. And I said that, uh, that I want to use a vector field, uh, this, like, this thing that basically make things move around. Uh, so for that, uh, we can use just noise. We can just use a big array of noise and poke into it uh, at different scales, uh, different resolutions, and use these, the values there to actually say, OK, let's poke in this value for, uh, to define the x coordinate of a vector, and this other value to define the y coordinate of a vector. And that way we will move our particles around. So let's start with just creating an array of noise. Uh, let's make that a function. Um, we won't need that many uh, values, uh, 8,000 ish, or to do. Uh, and I want these values to actually um, move uh, the, the particles on both sides, so it, it doesn't, it must not be between zero and one, uh, but like negative and positive value. So we need to yeah, call this to get the first value of noise. And we can also say that on click will we'll create new noise. Let's see, okay, nothing broke. So now we need to actually add this noise vector to the, to the velocity of our particle. Uh, so let's create, or let's call it add noise vector at. So we'll, we will pass our particle and a scale uh, to say, because we don't have much noise and we want to basically define that how we, like, I want to be able to say, okay, use that noise level, but zoom in 70 times or 100 times. So this is what I pass here. And let's implement this method. Um, so it needs, the particle on the scale. Uh, so I need to define the width of this noise vector or this noise vector field. Uh, so I just uh, let's use yeah 82, whatever. <laughs> uh, I need an, an index inside this noise vector. Uh, so I will take. Um, so then I need to divide the coordinates of a, of a particle uh, to map them to, uh, to the scale that I just passed in this function. Uh, so py divided by scale. I need an e then I need an index inside this noise vector. Uh, so we use the x and y or zero uh, times this noise width variable that's it's just arbitrary mapping of this one 
dimension array to just two dimension. And because I don't have that many variables, I can just do a and which will actually, it's like a modulo, but on integer values. Uh, and so I, need, I have an index uh, for the x coordinate, and I need an index for the y coordinate. And it can be just the same plus that. You see, things don't need to be like super duper perfect. <laughs> Uh, so then I just say noise. So for the for the velocity in x, I just add the noise value of the index x. And for the velocity in y, or the y component of the velocity vector, I just add the noise value in y. So let's see what we get. Okay. Uh, let's make this a little bit smaller. So, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, but you see, I, I keep adding uh, noise noise to the velocity, uh, so I, I need to like regain some control or, or like make things go a little bit less crazy. And what I can do is just multiply the velocity by a value that is a, a bit less than one, so it will decelerate, and then I add some noise again and decelerate and add some noise again, so it should be a little bit more smooth. Yeah, it's not bad. Uh, and if I click also, you see that I, on click, I call this new noise function, which modifies the, the array of noise. Uh, but that looks a bit weird. I mean, like super geometric and things have only one color. And that's because we poke directly into the array of noise. We, it's like when you actually uh, scale up an image using the nearest, ne uh, nearest neighbor uh, algorithm, which is exactly what I'm doing here. Uh, so let's do some linear interpolation. So linear interpolation is basically uh, when you poke somewhere uh, between pixels, you look at how far you are between the pixels and you, you put away, you say like, okay, I'm very close to, uh, to a pixel on the, on the right edge, so multiply the pixel on the right edge by 200 and the pixel on the left by 50. And then you, you get something that is multiplied by 256 and divide. So, and there's uh, so a pixel on the left edge is influences more if it's closer to the left. Uh, so let's do this. Yeah. I hope it's not too crazy. <laughs> so, um, so what we need to do is uh, we need to know how far we are on the on the edge. Uh, so what we're interested in is the fractional part, uh, how, where we are between pixels, so it's the x-coordinate modulo 1, it's just like between 0 and 1. Uh, so that gives us uh, the influence of a pixel on one edge, and we need to know the influence of a pixel on the other edge. That's this. Uh, so now, and we need to do that like for the pixels that are neighbors horizontally, and once we have done that, uh, for the horizontal neighbors in X and Y, we need to also do that for neighbors that are up or be below them. Uh, so let's let's do this. Uh, sorry. Uh, so let's get uh, the value of the X for the line above first. So noise at I X times I one plus noise X and the neighbor plus one times i zero, and then we we set the index of the for the x value. We move it down one line, uh, which is one line is noise width, and we do this is for the low value, and we need to do that also for the y. Dun, dun, dun. No, I keep. So now we have this x high, x low, which gives us uh, the weight, uh, weighted um, position or color horizontally. And now we need to weigh them, uh, the one above and one below, based on where we are between them. Uh, so it's, it's about the same, but this time we use y. And we can do p dot dx. 
uh, it's equal to x high times i1 plus x low times i0 so if I didn't mess it up things should be smooth now yeah it's good Um, it's nice, but it's always the same thing. <laughs> so uh, let's let's add this thing again, but this time we can do something that actually depends on the time. So that we will add this noise of this vector field at one scale, and we will add it again at another scale that varies over time. So things will move really over time. It would be much more interesting visually. Uh, we can just do something like this, sin times divided by 16, whatever. should be okay. So now we have basically two scales of noise, and one varies over time, the other is like a very, very low scale, like very high level of very little amount of details, uh, this, because we scale by 71. Uh, and now we have this over one uh, that has actually more detail because it doesn't, uh, scale uh, the noise so much. So let's we get something very interesting already. Okay, so something else we can do. Um, the particles you see that they, when they are dead, uh, we always recreate them at a random position. What we can do to make something a bit more interesting is uh, not always do that. Uh, so let's say if a random number is greater than, uh, than the x coordinate of a mouse, uh, which is between 0 and 1 uh, in our case, and let's, yep, okay, uh, I want to do it here. Uh, bam. So if a random number is greater than the mouse, X coordinate of a mouse. Instead of putting a random Y coordinate, we can do start from somewhere around the middle, vertically. So nothing happens if I, f if I am on the left edge, but if I go towards the right edge, is it the other way around? Uh, sorry. Oh, interesting, my... Oh, it should be okay. Yes, so now, yeah, it was inverted from the way I was thinking. So now if I put my mouse cursor towards the, the left edge, uh, the particle starts somewhere around the middle, vertically, and if I move towards the right, they are more random, but it's a bit interesting. Uh, it, it gives some some interesting visuals. Uh, so now let's try to make some music. And um, yeah, there. So uh, now in render we are incrementing the time uh, by the whole size of our buffer, and that's because we are not generating music. Now that we are generate, oh, we are going to generate music. I need a time increment, which would be. One divided by sample rate, uh, and so uh, so here I just have I loop through the audio data uh, and increment the time with a small time increment. Uh, the time is in seconds, so there's 60 seconds per minute. In music, uh, we offer, often talk about BPM, beats per minute. So we have 60 seconds per minute. We can, that's very slow beat. We can say times time two, that would be 120 beats per minute. That's not too bad. Uh, this is the time in seconds. And also in music notation, uh, if you have seen uh, music sheets, there's like, there's the notes, and every few notes there's a line, 
uh, called a bar and so on, it's three bits. And a bar often appears every four bits. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, so that's a bit divided by four. And there's also, we can think also, when we have reached x bits, uh, we can turn the page and play something else. So let's do something like this. Uh, and it can be also useful to think about like the time between the, the bits, like a bit is quite long, but we can also play short notes between the bits, so let's, let's keep track of that too. Uh, that would be the bit time for. Let's say we have four notes per bit. Um, so let's do, and we need, we, we're gonna create a, a signal, an audio signal, which starts at zero, and which we will add to our audio buffer. Uh, signal. So let's see what we didn't break anything. Good. Yeah. Now let's create the hi-hat that I mentioned earlier. So we will need um, a volume. Let's start. Not crazy. Uh, the envelope is uh, is on. We will put the hi hats on the beat, like so. That's really cool. Like, tch, 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 tch. Uh, so we'll do beat module one, uh, and with a power of eight. Uh, except that, okay. We, let's do this. Uh, signal plus equal. Uh, I have this. Very short functions, uh, just just generate noise between minus one and plus one. No. Okay, what is going on here uh, is that uh, I set the envelope, so the shape of this oscillator to follow the beat, but actually I want it to start loud and go down, so I need to do one minus the beat. Better. Um, since I'm doing percussions now, uh, let's do a crash symbol because I really love them. Uh, a crash symbol is uh, is basically a super powerful hi hat, uh, and I, I like also to make them like. To, to make a, like a small sound, like if you have a small brush, you're like brushing the drum before you like smash the cymbal. I like to, to do this because you, you feel the, the crash cymbal coming. So uh, basically we'll take an envelope, uh, we'll be, uh, we, we will make it slow, so on the pattern. Um, yeah, just a small power, uh, but not too loud for this uh, brush thing. Uh, so. Pattern modulo one will say shape the oscillator between from for the length of the pattern. So it will go crescendo and a bit exponential, the four that we see here, but not full volume. Uh, that's the point one that we see. So it will be just a gentle shh. Uh, so let's we can already listen to that. So let's take a noise times the envelope times the volume. So, um, 61, 61, oh, uh, yeah, how, what happened there? Okay. Can you hear? It's coming. So now we need to do the, the crash symbol. Uh, so then that would be uh, starting full volume. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's be nice and let's add the master volume, uh, which will be. So we will use the, the pattern as our master volume to basically say start low and go. Well, Increase the master volume of the whole thing and clip at one, don't go louder than one. Uh, yes. Let's do this here. Okay, so it's very silent at the beginning. A bit too silent. 
What? Yes, yes. Let's come and eat out for now. Well, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it starts low. And you see, we can still control the things. Okay. Now let's make it crash. So we want to crash at the beginning of a pattern, so starting. Uh, starting at one and decreasing with a pattern and modulo one so that it goes from one to zero and then back to one. But with a very high power to really crash really quickly. So let's go crazy. So now we have some nice percussions, and maybe we can use them for something, something good. Um, we have a canvas. Let's scale it. Uh, I can. Uh, the crash symbol is the last thing I do in the sound, so I still have the the envelope, the thing that actually shapes the crash symbol, so I can use it there. Uh, and just to add a little bit of the randomness, uh, semi-randomness, let's let's book a value in this audio data uh, times two. So you saw, but it just follows the sound. It follows the, the loudness of the sound. The Melody? Something? <laughs> um, uh, let's let's take another yeah, two, five minutes. Um, so what we can say is, let's say, starting from the first pattern, uh, we will play a melody. Uh, we can put yeah, rather low volume. Okay. Um, I will just say, yeah, the classic. I will put it on the note so that it goes really quick. It will be like, uh, and I can say frequency is one of his notes. Uh, uh, let's go there. Uh, you saw at the very beginning, I have this small string of numbers. Uh, and. It's just small numbers uh, that I generated uh, using, yeah, using some Markov chain. Uh, and uh, I cannot use it, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have to. Um, so le let's pick uh, one of these characters and multiply it by sound value, 64, uh, and add that to our signal. Uh, let's use a, a SOTU oscillator. Uh, so tooth oscillator is basically, it looks like the shape of a so, so tooth. It goes from zero to one and then back to zero, uh, back to zero and one. Um, it's very nice because it, it actually contains many frequencies. Uh, a pure tone is just a sinus. Uh, so we need one type, uh, volume. So on the f after the first crash, we should get this melody. Let's do one last thing. Uh, yeah, uh, count. Okay. Uh, okay. So 
So first, let's not render all the particles at once. Let's follow the master volume. And also, we have this nice function uh, that generates new noise uh, when I want. And let's generate new new noise when uh, when the symbol, uh, crash symbol crashes. So I need to know the pattern before. generating my sound. Um, yeah. So, uh, this thing, uh, basically, it does uh, exclusive or in binary. Basically, if you have two numbers, it checks if they are the same integer values. Very brief. And if the pattern changes, I do it new noise. Yeah, I know, I know. I hear that a lot. Why? Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's super fun, super rewarding. Um, and you, you learn a ton of things by doing these kind of things. And of course, it doesn't have to be that crazy. Like, you go on your own pace, learn new things. But the re real key there is to actually try something different, try something useless and explore new ways. You, you will learn a lot, and you can totally bring that home. You can bring that to work. And like, uh, Even though I write TypeScript uh, all day long, I, I always come up with new ways to solve our problems, like more simple ways to solve our problems. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about this, I highly recommend you to read uh, The Nature of Code by Daniel Schiffman. He's a teacher at NYU. Uh, you can find him online on YouTube. Uh, where he does uh, live coding and coding challenges, where he explains algorithms and so on. He's an amazing teacher. Really check the nature of code. And uh, next month, uh, there will be JS1K, uh, the JavaScript code golfing competition where people try to do something cool, fun, in one kilobyte. Uh, you should at least have a look and maybe enter. It's, it's pretty fun. And it doesn't have to be like something mind-blowing. Just, just have fun. Thank you so much, Script. It's been amazing. If you have any question, I will be there. You can find me online on as P01. Uh, no problem. And now go and code art, please. <laughs>